Hello everybody, I've just hopped out of the cutest, most adorable car I think I've ever featured on the channel, the BMW Isetta bubble car, and now I'm getting into something that's about as far away from that as you could possibly imagine, a Dodge Charger. <laughs> This though is no ordinary Charger, this is a 1968 Dodge Charger RT, complete with the 440 cubic inch engine, that's 7.2 litres. And as muscle cars go, the Charger RT is royalty, if for no other reason than its starring role in one of the greatest movie chases of all time, the one in Bullet. I'm sure many of you are sat there thinking, no, 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 James, you've got it all wrong. Steve McQueen drove a Mustang in Bullet. In fact, that's why there is a Bullet Mustang still available now. And you're right. But the car he was chasing was a 68 Charger RT. I have to admit, this is one of those videos where I'm not really going to be telling you an awful lot that you probably don't know. Instead, this is more, uh, come and have a drive with me as we take something really nice out. I will tell you what I do know, and then I'm hoping people that know these cars better will be able to hop into the comments section and share a few interesting tidbits with the rest of the class. This is actually the second generation of Dodge Charger. The first lasted only a couple of years. In fact, even this didn't last all that long. These were really, in some ways, a response to the incredibly popular Ford Mustang. However, the first version simply didn't sell in the quantity that Dodge hoped. By the second year, they shifted only about 15,000, where Ford was shifting a multiple of that number every year with the Mustang. Curiously, one of the articles I read cited the fact that people preferred the Mustang's more compact dimensions over the larger Charger, which would then make you think for the second generation, Dodge would shrink the car. But they did not. They in fact made it half a foot bigger. This car is 5.3 meters long. In other words, this is the same length as a 2008 long wheelbase BMW 7 Series. It's huge, absolutely massive. It does make a good noise though. And it really pulls. Many American muscle cars that I've hopped in aren't actually that quick, which is not to say that this is savage. Unfortunately, it is blunted by a considerable curb weight. Precise, I don't know, but here's best guess. It also has a three-speed automatic gearbox, which no matter how good it is, is going to sap some power and is not going to be the most efficient. These were available with a manual, but I believe, like many a muscle car, that is actually quite a rare thing to find. If you want a manual one of these, the best thing to do is probably just buy an auto and put in a more modern manual box. I'm also not entirely sure what exactly the RT bit gave you. I know this was the top of the tree. This was the Charger GTI, the Type R, as it were. Though I don't think this is probably any lighter than a regular Charger. If anything, it was heavier. So I expect the suspension is a little bit beefed up. It feels a little firmer than I'd expect from your typical muscle car. Probably some extra stuff like, uh, I know, nicer wheels and things like that you would get. But beyond that, I honestly don't know. The engine, I'm sure, is a, a big part of it, but that's it. Why does this car's owner have it? Well, simple. He always wanted a classic car, and he wanted a muscle car, and what better to get than a Charger RT? In much the same way, I suppose, as I really desperately want an Aston Martin V8 Vantage X-Pack, because they look and sound cool. I don't really know that much more about it, and this car's owner, Ali, is very much the same way. He has it, he loves it, but in terms of the nitty gritty, the fine details and stuff like that, he's not too fussed. And I can understand why, because really, what you want this car to do is make this noise. soundtrack. Unfortunately, the um, speedo isn't working, so I genuinely do not know how fast I'm going. 
but I'm sure it's not fast enough to really cause a problem for anybody. As is typical for American cars, despite it being enormous, there isn't masses of space in here, but more than enough for four adults to be relatively comfortable. He has done some things to the steering and it feels a lot more connected to the road than I've experienced in other cars of the period. In fact, two cars I've driven recently I can draw comparisons with, the 1965 Ferrari 330GT 2 Plus 2 and the 1973 Jensen Interceptor, which actually has a very similar engine to this, a 7.2 litre Chrysler lump. Ali imported this car back in 2016 from a gentleman that ran a thermoplastics company in Indiana. He had it for a few years, did a little bit of work to it and generally enjoyed it. Unfortunately, on a trip up to Knock Hill, the oil filter let go. The seal essentially burst and the car dumped all of its oil. Sadly, by the time he noticed something was up, the damage was already done and the engine had to be rebuilt. The rebuild didn't go so well, so it went down to a chap in Doncaster called Dave Balladew. I'm told he is the man in the UK for anything Mopar related. Curiously, during the first rebuild it was discovered this car didn't actually have the correct engine in it at all. It was in fact a 1978 engine, this being a 68 car, and may have been sourced from something like a motorhome because they put those engines in motorhomes. And Americans complain that Lotus used the engine from a Camry in the Evora. Anyway, the engine was then rebuilt to correct RT spec, modern day RT spec, so it now makes a real 370 horsepower. Even with the three speed gearbox hobbling it, you put your foot down and this really is a car that will move. In my Jensen video I mentioned the fact that that car only had 250 horsepower because it came from the era where American emissions regulations had gotten an awful lot stricter. A few people pointed out to me that that was also the time when America changed their rating system, which is certainly true. They used to have a gross rating and then they went to a net one. So essentially when they used to dyno their engines they did it without any accessories attached at all and the numbers produced were not really equivalent to those in Europe, your DIN numbers or your brake horsepower. The truth is though that both the rating change and emissions were just as brutal as each other and cars went from making near to a genuine 400 horsepower to more like 200 horsepower. It's fabulous. This car is also full of lovely little details. The 8-track player up here which doesn't work but has the correct 8-track in it. Who's next by the who? You also have this very clever stacked instrument gauge here with a clock ahead of the rev counter. The speedo, as mentioned, doesn't work, but you've also got fuel gauge, temperature, oil pressure, and alternator amperage. Over here, you've got some basic controls for the panel illumination, the car's lights, and everything else. Incidentally, the lights on a charger are some of the coolest you will ever see. Up the front, a little panel drops away to reveal the headlights. This is a vacuum operated system and um, isn't always the most reliable. So that's something you need to watch out for if you're going to use the car as an actual daily or at night. Not a lot of people now are, I think, so it's something easy to miss. This being absolutely enormous and left-hand drive, visibility is something of an issue. Luckily, people can generally see you coming. I love the red of this car, it's absolutely sensational. I also love the fact that in the little fake bonnet scoops, very silly and annoying, you do have little indicators that only you can see and I don't know why they're there at all. They're very little use in the daylight but it's cool. This car doesn't appear to have air conditioning but with the windows down and it's not too warm today it's actually okay in here. The brakes are not servo assisted so do need a bit of shove and they're not particularly good. In the tradition of all old muscle cars, this does go much better than it stops. A couple of years ago, I got to experience a whole bunch of different muscle cars all at the same time, and I came to the conclusion that most of them were pretty much the same thing, just in a different packaging. In other words, they made a great racket, but weren't actually that fast, had terrifying handling, awful gearboxes, regardless of whether you went for manual or automatic, and when you could actually get some power out of them, they simply then the rear wheels because they were so tiny and pathetic. 
I think it's fair to say that in terms of handling and the drive, this car actually equips itself better than any other American muscle car I've driven thus far. It is closer really in terms of handling to the Jensen Interceptor, in fact may even be a touch superior, but truth be told I'm on an unfamiliar road today doing unknown speed so I'm not really going to take any chances. It isn't perhaps quite as dramatic and well put together as the Ferrari 330 that I experienced, but that of course would have been a car that cost when new an awful lot more and now an awful lot more as well. In case you're wondering, to buy a good Charger RT here in the UK, you probably spend about 70,000 quid. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> I think there's some loose change at the back because I can hear it rattling around. I hope it's a load of quarters. There is actually some feel from the steering, but quite a bit of play. Car does roll a fair bit. Left hand drive thing is slightly terrifying. Ali did actually once calculate the fuel economy and it was um, 12. On a run, you might get 16. He would love to take this around the North Coast 500, already living in Scotland, but at uh, two pound a litre currently for fuel, that's not gonna happen. Whoa. It's fantastic. In the wet, I am told it really will struggle for traction. That is not a surprise. But generally speaking, it's fabulous. I've got a confidence in it I don't have with many old American cars. This feels like it's been well cared for. Visibility is actually okay. Yeah, it's massive, but I can see the bonnet. There's plenty of glass in it too, and it's sort of well behaved. Brakes, come on, come on. Even the gearbox actually isn't all right, it's not great, but it's not entirely terrible, and the car has more than enough poke that I don't think it really matters which gear it's in. Most importantly though, the car looks the business, sounds the business, and let's be honest here, if you were buying an old 60s muscle car, were you really getting it for the way it went round a bend? I didn't think so. Truth be told, if you want to rip this car apart, you could. The weird pleather interior is all strange and odd. I love the extra gauges down here, and it is to me a gorgeous slice of still relatively authentic 1960s muscle car. I kind of love it. It's even got a decent sized boot. Anyway, there's another look at what I think is a very interesting, if massive, classic car. If you'd like to see more like this on the channel, please share this video with your friends, comment down below, and if you happen to have something like this you'd like to see me review, please drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every video. For now though, all you have to do is hit the like button, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, and even if you have, make sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified of every single upcoming video. And with luck, if I don't crash this into a log, I might even be allowed to go of this again in the future. Thanks to you all for watching. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.